may find yourselves in another part of the world, or you may find yourselves in London, in a beautiful arts centre, in the recreation room. <laughs> and you may ask yourselves, how did I get here? <laughs> Sometimes I find myself walking down the street. Sometimes I find myself feeling like I always have. And sometimes I catch sight of my reflection in a window and she whispers, you are 50. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I find myself browsing through the rails and sometimes I find myself reaching for a dress and she mouths at me, if you wore it first time round, you can't wear it now. <laughs> and I ask myself, how did I get here? <laughs> I've travelled down the road to nowhere, where used up bands play disused bars and wail like sirens warning us too late. Sometimes, I think, I'm doing a cover of my own life. <laughs> same songs, same words, same sad refrain. I can still hear London calling, but this time there's kids with empty bellies queuing on our streets asking, what have I done to deserve this? We always said we'd rip it up and start again. Instead, we've gone and thrown it all away. My mind is like a plastic bag full of the stuff they make us buy. Same as it ever was. But now, they call it vintage. <laughs> is your typical university student. This is Dave's head. And wherever Dave's head is, his heart cannot be far behind. Head! What is the biscuit situation? Well, there's only one left, and it's giant! <laughs> Greedy hands and grubby fingers have left one lone survivor. Did you know, Hart, that if you shake a pack of biscuits hard enough, all the calories drop down to the last one? So in theory, this, this biscuit, is the biscuit that you absolutely, catastrophically should not eat. Calories. That's for Belly to worry about, man. This is the last biscuit in the Isle of Paradise dead centre of a ceramic sea. Imagine warm waves of your saliva breaking against its beauteous beaches. A storm of sensation, a whirlpool of wondrous yum. It's a rich tea. Possibly the plainest, driest biscuit of all the biscuits, and it's a biscuit. It's a biscuit. And what are we? Together? A sentient being. <laughs> the soul, the flame. We uh, are Dave. Dave. And what is Dave? A student. Exactly. We need all the food. <laughs> we need all the food we can get. <laughs> Heads, no one knows more than you how strapped. I've we done are. the sums. <laughs> can we take another super don't, noodles dinner? Don't, don't talk to me about super noodles. And you know we're going out tonight. Betty says he can handle it, but we know we need to fill up. This biscuit, this rich tea, this rich tea, could be the difference between Dave, party hero, and Dave in a taxi home by town. Ed, eat the biscuit. Eat the biscuit. Ed, eat the biscuit. Fine, you are having the biscuit. Our 
faces. It's vague. Toss lines across the internet and laid in wait. We're searching for beauty in a keyboard. First dates on laptops, top prospects, a shopping list. And cyber women. Cyber women. Of cyber women. See, spoken word doesn't mean anything in this sea but a well timed wink from me. Poetry. <laughs> Chloe. Chloe was a scientist. So I, I planted my fingerprints on the phone screen and told her to find me. And she got on a plane to Ukraine. Never came back. What down and it's a numbers game. Emily. Now, Emily, she liked games. We played tick, tack, toe. For a week. <laughs> but I knew we'd never meet. So I uh, just crossed her off my list of cyber women. Of cyber women. That made me feel. That 
made me feel, made me think of Doctor Who's TARDIS. It happened just down the road and round the corner from our house, we are gymnastics. That made me wonder, <coughs> not a very good thing to do to your children. My mum likes to take our toys down to the dip, to the charity shop, making room for lots of presents our cousins give us at Christmas time. Maybe I'll get Doctor Who's sonic screwdriver and use it to make things start all over. Maybe that match of taking his children to the charity shop so that they could be fostered, like my friend Robert at school. I know a boy's got behaviour issues. Maybe that man has behaviour issues. Glued to the side of my plane are chilli seeds for rocket fuel. Felt tips fill broad purple strokes disguised in the pink love hearts my mum stuck on each wing. <coughs> Soaring through a doodle sky down below Dolby is a postcard flyby. I draw on my window <coughs> from my mum and Chinua and me and for the ghosts of those six children so that we can forget about the pain and love and enjoy my purple plane. <laughs> Second album in my CD player. It's the same street where everybody knows me, and I wish I knew nobody, so I could find my own gleam of gold in a world of beige paint. Not even in bottles of beer or endless piles of books I will read. Fun day. The real, the real world scratching up my belt of skin. That isn't dive bars or, or comic books that I, I will never read. <laughs> because an ecosystem at the bottom of my bookcase. The xylophone keys my ribs used to be. Chocolate sauce into metal structures of doubt and loathing. Where they used to put the sign of loveliness and laughter around its heart. I made music once. I'm just a one gear mess. The others are floating turtles around the sea of Portsmouth. I've seen a car before. Or that person. Or that tree. As you headed towards a place you've driven off for two years now, but felt too colourless to come. A place where they let their engines drink out like 40 m church bells and drunken walks home. You will be as welcome as the time we will walk off dead of shorts to a Halloween party. You are not a car. You are not a human. You are just that piece of banana skin I put here to keep you here in a foothill of useless. You always used to think they changed direction instead of signaling changes. Yours have been flashing for too long. Now you're just rusting on this road. I'm dragging you here like a dead rat on a string. Go and charge in there. It's loud. They'll laugh. They'll swear. They'll cry. And yes, they'll drink. But they are all human. And you're more human that you fooled yourself to be. <laughs> Therapy really is not for me. Like, 
I do not get how psychiatry came to the conclusion that things like Tai Chi could be beneficial to people who, from what I've seen, would like to top themselves. Secondly, there's only two kinds of people that you're going to find here. The first are like completely gone. They are bouncy or mental. They are hitting off the angles of the walls mental. Their pupils are permanently dilated pills mental. They don't necessarily have to be erratic. They've got too much, absolutely nothing going on in their attic. The second kind of what I call those semester mentors. But I'll get to them a bit later on. But now let me tell you about Rose. Now, this girl is obese with psychosis, drugs, and hospital food. It's been a week. And from my observations, she is definitely a number one. Because she doesn't speak to anyone. She just wails down the ward corridors and she's even got her own language going on and it's like some weird form of English that she's twisted into new words she finds either hilarious or distressing. And I've come to know them as Rose's riddles with no middle ground. And then there's Liz, who all the new types think is fine, but I see how she sits every day on the same black sofa with the same mug of revolving herbal teas, the same left leg propped over her right knee, and she just stays there, always until midnight, until the first time the second hand reaches the third second line between the four and the five on the clock. She misses it. Liz is staying up. And that's just how her brain works. She punishes herself for switching off. But anyway, on to the second kind of people like I was saying, they're called those semester mentals, and I have seen them time and time before. Walking in through the double doors of my best ward, strutting in this place, straight jacketless. And when they got me, I didn't get the luxury to choose to use my feet. But it's okay because semester mentals are just having a little psychotic episode and all they need to do is change the channel to get a handle on things again or call their parents to pick them up when the blood test, clinical walls and prison showers get a bit much. <coughs> and then there's me. I am neither of those two kinds of people. See? I've got a secret. I've got a handle of things. And nobody knows it. Except for me. A Komodo dragon's venom lunges into the antelope's wounds, whispering death into its bloodstream. Arrogantly waiting for it to weaken, the Komodo follows it for days, learning its habits and staking its claim. The slender antelope, unable to retaliate, is impaled with poison, its skin peeled like an orange and never existing in the same form. Where are you? I was waiting for you. And the Komodo that crawled up a nostril to leave. Not believing it was you standing over me with an eight-inch kitchen knife when my eyes greeted day. 
I breathe with caution and barely blink. The weight of an eyelash could pierce the protective air between us and break my faith in you. The qualification was genius, fluent Italian-speaking quadrat, musically dexterous, creatively infectious monotone eater. The council estate descendant invited to number 10 word warrior, the golfer, the footballer, the penniless community leader, the intellectual reader. So I wait for you, and the commodo in your mind to leave. My bed now a bamboo raft, navigating the ravenous sea of sane and insanity. I'd entangle you from the dragon and let you in my inner sanctuary to keep you safe. To make you man again. But it's too late. I see the forked tongue hiding behind the nicotine stained teeth and hear the cutting tones of its voice say, You belong to me. So I leave you and my body behind while it's occupied. Carefully pack my mind and escape to Venus. I believe in you, like how a child believes whispering her dreams on a candle makes it come true. Like a power supply for a destructive machine, you were a shaman evoking the soul of the dragon. Premeditatedly set the scene, and recorded with emotionless eyes, you captured your souvenir, forever energised with the memory of a mutilated antelope. Okay. 
diplomacy comes with age. <laughs> it is embedded into their culture that at 17, I can't do anything. Refusing to ask me their questions. This is a fault. The unaware that culture is software, it can be updated if your mind is in. I find it strange that some people can spend their entire life without questioning what they've been told. Forcing themselves to adore what's been put in front of them, never realising how free they are. So I will run in flip-flops, trying hard not to trip, escaping normality. I'll try to stop smudging myself in order to fit in that I will never be conventionally attractive. When I was younger, I thought my hair was ugly, my skin the wrong shade, but I learned to entwine my fingers with truth rather than television. I'm not wrong, just different.
plants above our heads, conspiring with the smoke machine to give us all halos. The stench is togetherness. On the dance floor, a mass of bodies move as one, except her. She's a promotional neon sign for a brand name beer, but brighter. The shine refuses to be contained to her body, it oozes out. She glows. This is typical heart behaviour, chasing around the first piece of tail that wags in front of you. You know what this is? This is the rich tea all over again! This girl is a rich tea! <laughs> she is a jammy dodger, never I saw She's a bourbon. Just a nibble round her edge is more than I deserve. This girl is a chocolate covered hobnob. I want to dunk her. I want her stuck to the roof of my mouth. And how many chocolate covered hobnobs do you think we've seen just this week? Right, how are we meant to know if they are or not without taking a bite? Head. Try the biscuit. <laughs> try the biscuit. <laughs> and try the biscuit. All right, fine. We're only talking to her. All right, sick. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Hail, hail, hail the daily 
I was named Kelly after the men who drank the sea between Ireland and Scotland because they weren't ready to go home yet. And when they danced in up circles, they bedded their ways away from families with too many mothers, brothers and sisters, becoming husbands of mothers, building houses on coal. Kelly, it's a name that promises to support the roof, but does not promise to support its own legs as Friday falls into Saturday, or Saturday stumbles into Sunday, or Sunday collapses into the roast dinner that took before bloody breakfast to make. <laughs> a 
Kelly is a cocktail, eight parts blood, two parts whiskey. <laughs> Cannot promise to be on time, but it does promise to nick some vegetables from the farmer's field on the way back from the pub. <laughs> a Kelly can steal future forgiveness. <laughs> a Kelly is a man who can make, fix and survive bloody anything. And that name landed on me like a miner's helmet, bending the neck, shining the headlamp towards the ground. So I practiced digging in the flower beds, climbing the coal bunker, preparing myself to be a man. I got two feet closer to Australia. <laughs> then I hit concrete. So did my dad and my granddad. <coughs> Game over. Your dinner's ready. And because of a cow, we never vote Conservative. <laughs> and Joel, I was named after Billy Joel, the piano man with the uptown girl. My parents recorded that name onto a birth certificate turned cassette sleeve inlay. They weren't fans of his music. <laughs> they would record over it. <laughs> Ziggy, Aladdin, Thin White Duke, Halloween Jack, Bowie. But we already had an Uncle David, so Joel. <laughs> Joel. Joel. They liked the sound those four letters cried and said them softly until I went back to sleep three hours at a time. Joel. Joel. It's a nice sound to name a baby that doesn't sound too babyish when he's old. At five, Joel has been written in more cards than Christopher, Tiffany, and Francesca because it's easier to spell. <laughs> Joel will have friends. At 12, Joel is a sound on a bank statement. At 17, Joel is pixels on a UCAS screen. At 24, Joel is a handshake on a CV that is read all the way through. Joel. I don't always say it properly, so a lot of people think I'm called John. <laughs> if I don't correct you, I'm sorry. It's not you. <laughs> me. <laughs> Joel, four letters to good cop, bad cop with that surname. Joel, a bloody name that isn't in my blood like Kelly. It's a label. Stick it onto my shirt for small talk. Icebreakers. Whilst my surname would rather break ice into cold chunks and let whiskey pour over them. <laughs> Joel waits until 7pm. My name's Joel Kelly. It's a hard name for me to live up to. Personally, it reminds me I can't really play piano. <laughs> I don't have an uptown girl. I'm not Irish. I don't mind coal. I don't even do a manly job. It reminds me that I'm 26 and I don't have children. But I'm not just a Joel, and I'm more than a Kelly. More names than I know of went into making me. And I was nurtured by two fans of David Bowie. That's a stage name. I'll tell people Joel Kelly is a stage name. Jean Kelly. Grace Kelly. Yeah, okay. Joel Kelly. The muted tones of people, anxious to get their movements done, hums like a tired choir. Black screen above my head flashes boarding gate 29 for flight EZY2433. Leopard print travel bag, coat, and iPad deposited between two grey trays. Today's the day they'll see beyond the surface. See, I wear my granddaughter's smile to keep me upright. My daughter's hope to keep me breathing. Hijab-clad elderly woman sets the buzzer squealing. If Reuters have done their work, I should pass without a blink. Today's the day that I'll walk through 
if they don't see me like I see them seeing me, I know I'll have taken a stride. If they don't see me like they were raised to see me. Each time she enters the machine, it betrays her anxiety, squeals like a banshee. Handheld detector scans hijab for hidden bombs and detonators. But today's the day that I'll pass through, because I'm tagged out in jeans from bench and a sweater from Gap. That blends in, surely. It shows some assimilation has taken place. I speak without much of a jammo twang. Security clerk feeds trays through scanner like clockwork toy. He fires French in my direction without looking. Although I know he sees me flinch. Je ne comprenais pas, I reply, before his translation knocks me flat. Take off my hat. I spy hijab woman fumbling to put on shoes. They've handled her plenty. If I, was, if I was Kate Middleton, before she met Prince William, would this happen to me? I don't know. I can only speculate. Do probabilities, percentages and ratios? Guess. He orders me to stand to one side. His gesture says you have yet to see the extent of man and his doing. He makes me stand like Christ, arms outstretched. Little children stare at my shame. He pats my right leg from thigh to ankle, my left from ankle to thigh, each arm from the pit to the wrist rubbed down. He runs his thumbs around the waist of my jeans and under the rims of my breast and then down my spine and then he squeezes. He squeezes the 82 dreads curled to an eighth of their size in my knitted black hat. He squeezes in between the coils, squeezes like he's milking a cow. Nothing but Samson's strength rests here. After two phases of what floats by, I'm taken behind the scenes to meet her, the supervisor. She puts people in their boxes, asks who I am. I'm an artist. I write words and I turn them into poems and songs. I paint stories with parables and proverbs and I and I sing speeches. I have nothing more to declare. She orders me to take off my coat, my jeans, to pull down my faded underwear so she can see. Explains she doesn't want to invade my privacy. <laughs> so she asks me to do her work for her. And I oblige because of the citizen I was raised to be. So I use my fingers to spread my behind wide so she can see. And as the architect of power signals my dismissal, I leave behind the shame, but take with me the words.
Dust grows heavier with stillness, and so now it blankets my eyelashes, capes my shoulders, trickles past my lungs, and sits in my ribcage. Claustrophobic loathing develops for this kind of settlement, turns into escapism, and splashing out on weeks and weeks away to anywhere. Anywhere, which is new or unfamiliar, that will gift me a pinpoint memory, gift me some form of voyage. Where is your permanent address? The coach always drags me back to the same morning view, gathered thoughts, bus route and shortcut. There the dust settles again, a migraine of pittance.
vision that you had, like however many years ago, it's their vision that you had for all of you, but it's just incredible what you've created. And thank you for providing a space where I can now step into and share some of my work, so thank you. Um, so, I've been writing a lot of new material recently. Can I share some with you? Yes. Good, because if you'd have said no, it would have been a really abrupt end to the show, so I'm glad you said yes. Foreign bodies. When a stranger pronounces my name right, I want to cut our ears off. Dig for other sounds we share. There are names I cannot pronounce. Each time, my tongue becomes a guilty weight. I score a tally on my thigh of all the countries I have not been to. I want to burrow far enough into your chest for me to strike your origins until they burst like oil from your open cavity. We love what is foreign because it reminds us of ourselves. I've spent my whole life with myself in varying states of consciousness. <laughs> Still, I feel like I know so little about it. On the floor of a bathroom, in a house whose owner I do not know, at a party I was not invited to, I lie. Oh, you know when you've written something and then you read how honest you've been and it's really, oh, I dressed as an angel, but I was in freshers in uni, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there, yeah? Um, head spinning as if I'm on my way to heaven and the stars won't stop circling me. In two years, you will remind me how we met. I will vow never to wear a fancy dress again. I will think of how much our bodies shift in a year. How we grow into them, like an orange being peeled in reverse. The rind <coughs> reattaching itself to the segments. My face is my parents' homeland. Sometimes, they look at it and cry for all the things they've lost. Their lost things crawl under my skin. Look, there's the river we never did swim in. I don't know which one of them spots it, that vein at my temple, but by the time they turn around, the other one has long gone. Entombed in my face is what they built together when they were in the business of making love and lives in foreign lands. My body is a passport. I've been using it to escape home. Men thumb it in the harsh light of liminal spaces, assessing its validity. When they return it to me, I run like the world is reverting to 1900 and there is only one plane journey left before everything becomes black and white and stay, and stuck. Before the wall to the kitchen was knocked through, my sister and I would make hot chocolate the old school way. A saucepan, full fat milk, a non-electrical whisk. Like all rituals, we were soothing hidden fears we had not yet learned how to name. We only got that ice cream because our home was falling down. And afters, at the top of Leighton High Road, did us cones for 99p. Stuck a flake in for free. <laughs> After our home fell down, at the top of Leighton High Road, we were evicted creatures, all lung and socket, cold and temper. We will try for many years to understand the different rage that festered in our bodies. Even if they were carved by the same creators. Even if it did stem from the same falling brick. We talk in length of the middle child syndrome. I accept when you tell me that I was younger, so it was different. And I let you craft all of our unedited history. You choose what baby photos to show to guests. Whenever I need to forgive, I make hot chocolate. Drive the avalanche back up the mountainside until I am eight. So I knew so much about forgiveness at eight. <laughs> it was 
natural. It was necessary. Somebody says sorry and you say it's okay. Even if they hurt you real bad. What use is it to carry other people's pain in your chest? I think I knew myself best at eight. I knew that I didn't want to kill the spiders. Even though I was afraid of them, went to bed imagining giant tarantulas lurking on the landing, waiting for me to sleep before making a dwelling of my mouth. <laughs> Grab me by whatever hair follicle tastes most like your own. Really, we are acrobats. Really, we have danced in every land. Moored the moons of Jupiter to our belted dresses. Really, all it would have taken was a simple stutter of the earth for me to have been given your name. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I've been I've been writing a lot about I think history and memories and how we recreate all of these memories. So I've got this vivid, vivid memory of me at my first birthday party and I walked for the first time and I can see it's in the kitchen and Carlina's over there and I'm walking and I, and I like do three steps and then fall over. But of course I don't really remember that, that's just stories that's been passed down and told to you. And it's kind of I think the same with history and the older you get and the more history that you have I think you start to be selective with what you tell certain people. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, and you're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I think the next two really are, are about um, those themes. Hidden histories. I am writing this from a decade you will not live to see. To ask what you did when history hid from you. Like a cruel brother in a foreign shopping centre. I cannot imagine what it is like waking in a place that is not the house you bore your children in, that is not beside your husband, who you know like the answer to a riddle. When somebody doesn't quite get his misjudged joke, it is as if that riddle has been asked and you are the only one who knows the answer. You bite your tongue until it bleeds and tastes of secrets. When you know the answer to the question, how can you not love its brittle bones? Time is a cruel orchestrator. Before I realise what finite means, you are gone, and when I want to ask you questions, you have long incarnated past the life of dust. Mike arrives just before the service. Your children will reunite to say goodbye to you. They're on the stairs for a photograph, and although this is not the time for photographs, it's the perfect time to watch them reassemble. Ten bodies that all came from your one, though that is now as cold as the oceans four of them crossed to get here, and sealed. I did not see the embalmer come. When the memories slid from your mind, I imagine it were like fine china slipping from your grip. When the word I am looking for perches on my tongue's tip, makes me cross my eyes to find it, I think of you. Wonder if my mind will also become an attic, too dusty to decipher what's been stored in it. He's all right, your youngest. Still keeps brief in bottles. Waits for a good moment to pour them down the drain. It hasn't come yet. Now I want to tell him that grief is not like fine wine. I think he already knows. We don't talk of you, but, but we don't talk much of history. And I often think he is a closed book on a top shelf. Often hope I will one day be tall enough to reach it. I've been thinking so much lately of history. How we live our present cloaked in a past of ghosts and conversations we never partook in. Some memories are slimy fish at the bottom of oceans, trying desperately not to be caught like the shoals of herring in the Irish Sea. I am a hungry fisherman 
who wants to cook them on an open fire. I don't know if you heard it, but I wrote a poem and read it out in the church at your funeral. I think I was eight in a navy dress bought from Dunn's. I think Paula did my hair that morning. I travelled back with Dad, just us. When I skipped back from the airport shop, I saw him crying, head in hands at the flight gate. I had not seen that before. Your youngest, he's all right. I wrote a poem for you, Grandma, because something in me knew I would create my own history from the scraps you left behind. I don't know why I always tell people that I started writing poetry when I was 13. When I remember standing on a box to reach the pulpit, reading your poem to the congregation who all knew you better than I did, I'm not surprised that my family were not surprised when I became a poet. I have been harvesting these words for decades. I've got one more longer one for you and then I'm going to do a really short one to end. Um, thank you for letting me share this. So I've been writing all of this and it's the first time I've shared it with anyone. And like I was in, I was at like a little coffee shop, because that's what I do now. I like go there and I like, write poems. And this guy, you know how like, the, the people who are always a bit like, oh, you've been here for about like, four hours now, why don't you have anywhere else to go? Um, and so he came up and he was like, what did he say? He was like, this is after a few hours. And he was like, oh, are you a student? <laughs> or are you writing a novel? And he laughed so hard at that. And I was like, no, I'm writing a poetry collection, which is even better. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got one more longer one for you. Pauline Highland. What will be will be. We can't change it. The past is in the past, my mother says. Whenever something bad is happening, or is about to happen, or happened long ago in a time we rarely speak of. On a riverbank in whips, surrounded by fag butts and dead grass, my sister says, but that's bull, isn't it? <laughs> of course you can change things. Of course the past is the past, but it doesn't mean that it is really past. The past is the root of every screwed up thing anyone ever goes on to do. I agree to an extent, like I always do. <laughs> but then I think of my mother, growing up in that small Irish town that hasn't changed in years. It's been three years since I visited. That in itself is a sin. The growth of my cousin's children tells me this. But I spent triple their lifetime returning every summer, and even the pain in the pub on the corner didn't change. I think of the stories that are only uncovered when my uncle visits. I'm now at an age where I'm not ushered to bed before their adult chats begin. I stay up with them as they dissect that clattering past of theirs. My uncle tells an awful tale about a family in Mullingar, how the son, who had mental health issues, battered his parents to death last month at the dinner table on hearing this, my mother says, I often think of Pauline Highland. Who's Pauline Highland? I ask. This happens a lot in these chats. Ghosts are conjured. Ghosts of teachers who used to drop them to school because they lived at the top of their land. Ghosts of men who were in the year above. But his brother was in my year. Us girls used to fancy him rotten. Didn't think much of his brother though. He was awful mean, I always thought. Now, dead, cancer, lungs, age 38, two kids. As my uncle tells my mum he saw one of Pauline's girls in the post office last week, it was a terrible shame. She was a lovely lady. Mum tilts her head toward me, but not her eyes, and says, she hung herself ash. Instinctively, I picture that unknown woman hanging in the barn as her husband, he was an awful git, Mick says, opens the gate. She had two young girls, my mother says, and I think of the pain that would make a mother do that. 
the monsters that haunt some people out of their body. The ghosts they then become. Wonder whether she still follows her girls, mid-thirties now. Whether she ever wants to slip back into the life she left, or if leaving was the freest she had ever been. And I think of all the other women hanging in my mother's head that she has never told me about. On the riverbank, my sister looks into the mirrored surface of the water. The reflection, unmistakably, is our mother. The past is in the past. It does not mean we do not trail it behind us like chains attached to the kitchen tables of our youth, like hair we never cut, like the timeline of humanity, like an excuse, like a collection of diaries too full to fit in any house now. There are graves containing people we love so hard that at the oddest of times, we think of digging with our bare hands and filed fingernails until we hit oak coffin. What would we say if they did rise from that unholy earth? We've had so long to plan a speech for their resurrection, but their dead face stunts our tongue. It is as if we did not believe they would come again. Thank you. I know that was quite heavy, so I'm just going to do a really short piece to finish. Um, short conversation had while stood in the frozen fish aisle on cost cutters. <laughs> Ash, come here when you're ready. Mum calls from the lotto stand in cost cutters. I'll never be ready, I sigh. <laughs> from whatever aisle I am perusing. Perhaps magazines, perhaps frozen fish. The other customers erupt at my precociousness. I wryly smile. Must have picked it up from a tired housewife on one of the soaps. <laughs> Outside, the day is lined up like snooker balls after potting. Thank you for being amazing. responsibility for every single element of this show from the stage management to the technical script to the flyer you see behind you absolutely everything was owned by these young people that you see on the stage and quite a few that you don't um, um, we're funded by Arts Council England and you have some evaluation forms on your seats this A helps us carry on existing and growing but B also lets us get better we really want to produce a really high standard of work from young amazing people please talk to us we'll be around for a little bit before we get on our crazy minibus Back to Nottingham. Thank you so much. This has been the Mouthy Poets. Ha <laughs> ha!